Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the PCI PAL PLC presentation for the year ended 30th of June 2020 and update on prospects. To start with, uh, if we could cover a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, before we begin, we would like to submit the following poll, which you will see on your screens. Throughout this presentation, investors will be in listen only mode. However, Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time by the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screens. Uh, or if anyone is dialed in via PCIPAL at walbrookpr.com. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. These will be available via your Investor Meet Company dashboard. Finally, we'd like to remind you that this presentation is being recorded. We anticipate that there will be some newcomers to PCR PAL, so we will take a couple of minutes at the beginning of the presentation to introduce the business. I would now like to hand over to Chief Executive James Barham and Chief Financial Officer William Good. James. Thanks, Tom. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I, I must say, William and I are really pleased to, to talk to you all about the business today uh, and to have the opportunity to provide this uh, very positive update on PCI PAL uh, following our year end. Um, it, it, it's been a substantial year of progress for the business, uh, particularly given it's been despite global pandemics, Brexit, elections and everything else that's been, been thrown at us in the year. Um, so thank you all for taking the time today. Um, a big welcome to those who are new to our story. Um, please do check out our introductory presentation on Investor Meet Company uh, and do take a look at our website, Knowledge Centre, to dig, dig a little more into our story as well. Uh, and welcome back to our existing followers and, of course, our existing uh, investors. So today of myself, James Barham, I'm CEO of the group, and with me is William Good, uh, our CFO. Uh, the, the presentation today will broadly follow the flow from the prelims RNS posted this week, uh, as well as providing a look ahead into my near term focus points uh, for the company. So, as Tom said, uh, before I do that, uh, let me give you some background, though, particularly for those uh, that might be new to our story. Uh, so, at PCI Power, we will work with any size company uh, to give them the ability to handle credit and debit card payments from their customers securely. Uh, we protect this data whenever a customer is making a payment, either by phone or through any digital payment channel. Uh, and the, the vast majority of our customers utilize our services within contact centers uh, or call centers, as they were traditionally known. Uh, and what we do not only secures a company's most sensitive customer data, uh, payment data, uh, de-risking their business from the risks of data loss, uh, but it also allows them to comply with the various governance standards that they must adhere to, no matter where in the world they're based. Uh, in particular, though, uh, it relates to PCI compliance, which is uh, the set of rules that govern how companies must handle customer payment data. So, as I said, that's credit and debit card data. Uh, and at PCI Power, we're the highest level of compliance uh, against those PCI standards, uh, which means we can handle data for any size company. Uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, and more, more than this, uh, we make the process of securing this data uh, easy and cost effective. And, and we do it in such a way that, that doesn't compromise the way these organizations wish to, to uh, engage with their customers. Uh, this is a real USP for us, actually. And uh, this is key in a contact center environment where customer experience is, is really everything. Onto our products, we've, we've three core products primarily. Uh, that we serve from our global cloud platform. Uh, we have Agent Assist, which is live agent payments. Uh, that's when you have a call center agent and a customer on the phone uh, speaking to one another. Uh, we have IVR, which is automated payments. So this is the type of system you may have used where you press one or press two uh, as you're going through, or it might be a, a speech-enabled automated service as well. And, uh, and digital, which we launched in January this year and enables um, secure payments through any number of digital channels like web chat, chatbots, SMS, social, um, email, and, and any form-based uh, uh, data. Uh, we sell these products primarily through channel partners, uh, which in the main is through resellers. 
um, many of whom we integrate our secure payment services to their own cloud products. Um, I've got more on our channel model later, so I won't go any deeper than that uh, right now. But um, hopefully that gives you uh, a, good, a good snapshot of, uh, of what we're all about. As I said at the beginning, uh, a hugely exciting year of progress and growth for this business. Um, since we started on this journey nearly four years ago, it's felt that this has been the year that's really proven out our SaaS revenue model, uh, growing our revenues by 56% year on year. And it's this expected uh, jump, uh, which is a result of uh, accelerated increase in our new sales bookings that we've made over the last 12 to 24 months. Uh, which has increased our key sales growth metrics of both ACV and, and TACV quite considerably. And William's going to talk more to those uh, in a moment. Uh, I, I'm personally predict particularly pleased, though, uh, that we've achieved these steps forward despite COVID. And I must say that our, our team's really excelled under what's been really challenging circumstances for everyone personally, everyone on this call, everyone within our business, everyone uh, across the country. So, so whilst COVID did have an impact on us, um, there is an upside and we've been able to continue our momentum, uh, making a, a good strong start to this new financial year as well. And uh, just, just to round off this section, in terms of the PLC and the board, uh, we have strengthened our board uh, during the year, putting in place uh, a new US-based chairman, uh, Simon Wilson. Uh, Simon has extensive international privates and, and public uh, software growth company experience. Uh, he's, he's also a British and US passport holder uh, and someone that was known well to the management team prior to joining. Now, uh, now moving on, I'll move on to our, uh, our COVID update, as is the way these days. Um, no, uh, no major change really to our views since the trading update in July. Uh, we're very well positioned as a business to minimise any impacts on the company. We've seen an uptick in demand for our services. Uh, which is a fairly natural consequence uh, of the increased levels of home working that are going on everywhere today. Uh, data security is a big part of any employer's risk considerations when moving teams to work remotely. Uh, we've seen urgency for project delivery continue uh, at the peak of the demand from new customers uh, that they wanted delivery yesterday. Um, that's calmed a bit, but clearly uh, new customer deployments as a result of COVID interest uh, do move at pace and, and uh, there's a lot of demand there for them to move at pace. Uh, but we've been able to achieve this given we're cloud only uh, and we can deliver our services entirely remotely. One of the main challenges uh, we've had uh, is a reduction in the predictability of the timing of new deals. So clearly this impacted us in our Q4 as COVID hit uh, for the entirety of our Q4 uh, lockdown pretty much uh, as, as new prospective customers uh, put procurement activities on hold. And this was mainly while they were figuring out their own response as a business to the pandemic, uh, let alone sign a, a PCI power contract. But this has certainly subsided a bit. And uh, since the start of the new financial year, uh, we're building a very strong pipeline in general, uh, which should serve to minimise any risk here, as we've got a uh, really strong opportunity backfill through that pipeline as well, if that, in the event that there is uh, any, any movement. Now, uh, we do benefit from having a channel first sales model selling through resellers. Um, these resellers are generally quite large and financially stable organizations with many of them similar to us being uh, cloud focused and very capable of operating as normal during these more difficult times. Um, we've actually been very busy working with these partners who've been driving marketing and PR to increase awareness of their services and, uh, and also the importance of ours too. Uh, for, for, for home working. So we have been riding on their coattails, you could say, but um, that's an essential benefit of our channel model. And it's very purposeful on our part that, that, that we get that opportunity to do that. And, and, and that activity, um, uh, plus, plus generally a rude awakening that many companies have had uh, regarding their communication solutions during this time, uh, ability to work from home, flexibility, all those considerations. This is what we believe will actually drive the pace of change in technology adoption from traditional on-premise hardware solutions to, to highly flexible, uh, robust cloud products. Uh, and this will certainly be good for us uh, long term being a, uh, being a cloud vendor ourselves. So, so to, to round that out, um, on the basis that we've, we've got good confidence in the strength of our sales pipelines today, 
uh, and that we're operating in line with our own expectations at the start of this new year. Uh, and we can still deliver projects at pace. Uh, we've maintained market guidance and we fully expect to take another significant step forward this year. Um, that's all from my, uh, my summary for now. So we'll start getting into some of the detail and I'll hand over to William for the, the, the financial uh, highlights now. Over to you, William. Good morning. Um, these are the financial highlights of the business. I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail in subsequent slides about uh, the revenue uh, and our recognised revenue, uh, the TACV number, which is a key metric for us, which um, is, is basically a metric for recurring, re uh, recurring revenue, um, our cash position and financing. Um, but the financial highlights is a good year for us, uh, despite all the challenges we've, we had at the end of the uh, period. Uh, revenue increased year on year, 56% to 4.4 million. Of that, 84% was recurring revenues. That's pure license um, revenue, which we'll see into the future. Our gross margin continued to improve to 69% and will continue into the future. Why is that? Because we have our, uh, you know, all our new sales are going onto our own AWS platform. Um, we increased our ACV figure in the year. Now, ACV is the recurring revenue we sign in a period. Um, so in the year, it was up 37% to 2.6 million pounds. And more importantly, we increased our TACV, which is the total amount of contracts we hold with recurring revenues to 6.75 million. Um, our loss came in line with expectations in the market, and we finished the period with cash of uh, 4.3 million having undertaken a fundraising in March, uh, raising £5 million from existing shareholders. And in addition, I've got £1.25 million worth of uh, debt facility available, which will be drawn down this month. Just turning to recognised revenue for the period, the, you know, the revenue we, uh, we, have, we have announced in the accounts. We do monitor this on a half and half and a year on year basis to make sure that we are maintaining momentum. So half and half, the revenue went up 43% uh, and year on year, 56%. Why the slight dip in percentage? Well, that's just down to a pure factor of um, the size and uh, size of deals that happen to go live in the period. Um, it's nothing to worry about. We're, it's just something we monitor uh, every month going forward. As I said, recurring revenues is 84%. And that's the important element of this, of this graph. The black bar... Uh, which shows 1.964 million pounds worth of revenue in the half. Well, that is our pure, li that is our licensed revenue coming through to us and our recurring revenue. The orange blob at the top relates to the treatment of our professional services and setup fees, which have to be prepaid over the length of the contract or the estimated contract, uh, contract length under the rules of IFRS 15. So during the period, during the half, we released nearly £300,000 and in the year, nearly £600,000. PS is an important element to our business because it actually allows us to um, generate cash. And in the year, we signed £1.2 million pounds worth uh, as part of our contracts. Um, these are all uh, charged on signature, uh, get collected, and then we, uh, and that forms an important part of our cash flow. As I say, gross margins were 69% in the period for the year. Um, we do expect that to continue to improve, and it should head up to the 80-85% over the next couple of years as the AWS contracts become more dominant. Um, finally, in the, uh, in the accounts, we announced that uh, uh, in the first two months trading to the, uh, of the new financial year to the end of August, we've continued the strong momentum with our revenue is up 41% uh, when compared to the same period in FY20. Turning to probably the, the most important metric we have within the business, which is our TACV. Now this is, the, you know, this is the metric of all the contracts, all the recurring revenue contracts that the group hold, um, you know, whether they're uh, live or in deployment or, or uh, sitting waiting to go into deployment. So uh, I finished the year uh, at the 30th of June with £6.75 million pounds worth of uh, contracts sitting in the filing cabinet that will generate when, all, when deployed 
£6.75 million worth of annual revenue, which we expect to go off into the future. Um, we started the year with £4.1 million pounds worth, or just under £4.1 million pounds worth, and so we've had good growth through the period, mainly on the back of our strong ACV sales. The reason why we monitor this, uh, uh, this no, the TACV so carefully is that ultimately it's the future metric for profitability and cash flow. Currently, as we're a loss-making company, um, we just we we need to make sure that we get to that point where we have more revenue coming in than cost going out. Now we finished the period at the 30th of June with 6.75, as I said, and our underlying cost base, excluding commissions and uh, amortization, was a shade over seven and a half million pounds. So if all the contracts were deployed, um, then we would have a you know, an ongoing loss of one million pounds. Now moving forward into FY21. If you make the assumption that we're signing similar amounts of uh, revenue, and that's what we need to do to be able to hit the new FinCap forecasts, then we should finish the year in June 2021 with 9.8 million or so of TACV. That means I would have that amount of contracts sitting in the filing cabinet. And at that point, uh, we will have more contracts available to us than our cost base which means that you know, we, once they're deployed in FY22, then we will be able to um, report profitability and cash break even, which is an important metric for this business. Moving on, just looking at the TACV by region, um, we entered the United States. We started selling our, our uh, services there in February 2018. And that is the orange bar section on the top of this uh, of the top of this graph. As you can see, that's starting to grow strongly, and ultimately, we expect that orange bar to overtake um, in scale the 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 black bar at the bottom, which is our EMEA market. The EMEA business has been uh, is a more mature business and has been established longer, so hence um, it's growing slightly slower but we expect the United, the United States and Canada to overtake that. The other thing to realize at the end of the period is not all the contracts we hold are deployed and therefore generating revenue. At the 30th of June, out of the 6.75 million, we had 4.1 million that was deployed generating revenue. So I was releasing equivalents of one, one twelfth of that number to the PL. Going through our deployment service, we had £2.1 million worth of contracts, which included two large contracts we won um, last year. I'm pleased to say that the, the large US contract, which was $550,000 worth of annual recurring revenue, has now gone live. So if you jump forward to today, that £2.1 million has gone down by, you know, by £440,000, and the deployed recognizing revenue figure has gone up by £440,000. So ultimately, um, all that 2.1 million will become live, and that is therefore used to underpin our revenue guidance for this financial year, uh, which stands at £6.7 million. You'll also see there's a small element at the bottom of on hold or awaiting kickoff. We always have a set number of contracts um, that are on hold. They're on hold for two reasons. Firstly, either the customer or the partner is real is organising its uh, resources uh, on its side to be out uh, to be able to deal with the integration we need, or secondly, the sale we have undertaken is part of a bigger one through our partners, and the partner is new to the customer and is putting in their telephony and um, CRM M systems first before they can link us link us in, and so we have to wait in line until that happens. But ultimately, we expect that half a million pounds to eventually become into deployment and then eventually be deployed and recognize revenue. Um, just moving to the income statement, I've already talked about the, um, the high level of recurring revenue visibility, which is um, driving the, the value of this business um, and the gross margin. The other point I'd like to point out here is the staff costs within the business. Yes, they went up 24% in the year, which reflects the sort of rollout of, of, of the people we hired in FY19. We now have 58 employees within the group. 
the good thing um, to, you know, I can confirm to you now is that we've built the, stu the structure uh, we require to drive this business forward. So we won't be doing significant amounts of hiring for um, new people. And we've already built our sales teams, our engineering teams, and our professional services teams um, with the capability of handling significantly you know, the, the, the amount of business we are generating. We will be taking on new people, but they'll be more tactical. So I'm expecting the growth uh, in staff costs to slow down. And a staff cost for, equate for 80% of my overall overheads, um, that, uh, that will slow the growth in, in costs, but we're not expecting recurring revenue to slow down. And this is why we're confident that during FY21, we'll start showing pro progress towards um, improved, prof uh, improved loss, and then into FY2022, we should hit that milestone where we hit both monthly cash flow uh, break even and monthly profitability. The cash flow will come ahead uh, of the profitability because of the nature of our SaaS, SaaS model. Just turning to cash flow, um, the business we you know, the business is funded by three areas: our cash reserves, which were 4.3 million at the year end. Uh, our debt and any equity we, we raise, um, the debt facility, I've still got 1.25 million to, uh, to, to draw down on, which will be drawn this month. The other important area of finance for us is our advance invoicing. Um, because we're a SaaS business, uh, what, we, what we like to do is we will charge PS work and set up fees on new contracts. And as I said, that was 1.2 million pounds worth last year, and they are charged on a signature. Um, uh, in advance, and we also, where we can, charge for annual you know, annual um, licenses in advance. So, if you look at um, the fifth line of that table, you can see our deferred income went up by two million pounds, or two point one million pounds. Well, deferred income is the is the uh, is a metric for the amount of advance cash uh, we have generated. So, with that advance invoicing coming in, and a you know, and a minimal amount of investment in uh, licenses and uh, property and plant, we actually only used three million pounds worth of cash um, you know, during the year, in spite of recording a loss of 4.3 million. Now, we finished the year with um, 4.3 million of cash and 1.25 million pounds worth of facility to draw, which gives me 5.5 uh, million pounds worth of cash um, to cover the losses for this year, which will be decreasing, and uh, as a small amount of losses in FY21. So we are in good position and good shape to um, make us uh, to take us through to that, ma that magic point of cash break even. In addition to this, we do have further debt. Uh, we are expecting to put further debt facilities in place to, um, uh, to, to, to help the business. Finally, um, just looking at the balance sheet, um, you'll see that there's a heavy uh, investment in fixed assets. Well, that reflects the investment we're still putting into our AWS platform, which was nearly a million pounds uh, in people. And I'm expecting a similar amount this year before it starts to wind down in FY22 and FY23 as the, as the platform becomes more mature. The other area uh, to note is the trade debt is 1.26 million, which seems high against the, um, uh, which seems high against the uh, uh, business when you're only generating 4.4 million pounds worth of turnover. Well, actually, if you analyze that to trade debtors, the vast majority of it does not uh, equate to invoices that affect revenue. Half of it related to new contract wins. And so those are you know, the, the professional services, set up fees and new, in, uh, new licenses coming through, which will go and sit in deferred income. The other half of, relates to our renewal cycles on contracts and quite a lot of those relate to uh, bills on advanced invoices um, as part of, the, uh, our, of our contract cycles. So in, in total, we actually uh, we collect all our debts in just over two, uh, two months. Um, uh, I think that's that's um, more than enough from me. So at this point, I'll hand back to James. Thanks, William. Um, okay, so a brief update uh, from me on our cloud technology. But as I said earlier, uh, please do watch our previous presentations for further detail as we're a bit limited on time today and I'm quite 
<clears throat> excuse me, quite keen to leave some time at the end. <clears throat> uh, cloud in general is really important to us. We talk about it a lot. Uh, and it is one of our competitive differentiators as well in our market. Um, we, we were the first in this growing space to launch a cloud-only product offering. Uh, and we're the only provider in our space with a global cloud presence with a partner first go to market sales model. And uh, it's a critical component of uh, our recent success in winning partnerships with some of the fastest growing, uh, most popular cloud telephony vendors in the world, uh, some of which we, we, we've listed like Vonage, TalkDesk, uh, 8x8, all, uh, all, all global operators growing very quickly. <clears throat> uh, we have instances of our platform across uh, EMEA, North America and ANZ, uh, Australia, New Zealand. We launched the platform in October 2017, having selected uh, Amazon Web Services or AWS as our, our hosting partner. And since then, it's matured a lot. Uh, and we've customers live across uh, all of those six uh, regional instances worldwide. <clears throat> um, prior to this platform, uh, we did run a, a more traditional privately hosted environment in the UK, which we still have. Um, but we've purposely not sold any new business on this platform since um, early 2018, so nearly over two and a half years ago now. Um, but, but this is one of the reasons we're experiencing such substantial increases in our gross margins as the AWS uh, hosted services uh, have been sold for, for some time and, and, and they're very much uh, margin heavy as they come through. And that will continue to, uh, to, to increase those margins. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we did launch uh, our digital product uh, earlier in the year. Uh, and since then, we also launched Rapid Remote, um, which is a rapid deployment version of our agent assist product, which we fast tracked as a response to the increasing demand we were seeing for secure payment solutions for home workers. Uh, and that was during the onset of the pandemic. Um, so we were quite uh, opportunistic there to a degree. Uh, it's actually been really successful for us. Uh, and as we anticipated, it did open up a number of discussions, including with the largest customer that we signed uh, in our Q4, um, which is now now live in uh, in record time, as we've uh, we've reported. <clears throat> um, along with cloud, the second pillar of our current strategy is our channel go to market sales model. Uh, we set out an objective several years ago to become a channel first business. Within two years, we'd achieved this, with the majority of our sales coming from channel partners. And in the year just gone uh, just under 80% of our new customers came through channel partners. Um, I'll often refer, and I have in this presentation, to our channel strategy as being uh, channel first or partner first, and that's because we're not channel only. Um, we do sell direct, but this tends to be more enterprise-sized deals, which are uh, much more like a large partner to deal with, actually. Uh, and we're certainly seeing more enterprise-sized organizations looking to the cloud for security solutions uh, just like the two enterprise deals we signed in the year, one in the UK, uh, the other in, in the US. Now, uh, whilst the majority of our new customer contracts uh, came through the channel, the proportionate value of these contracts is lower, currently at 42% versus direct at 58%. Uh, now, we do anticipate the proportionate value of channel deals to increase over the coming years, as whilst to date our direct deals have tended to be higher value, um, the volume is now coming through from our partners, and this is where we will achieve scale. Um, after all, the majority of the contact center market opportunity is less than 250 seats in size. And in contact center terms, uh, that's mainly your small to mid-sized centers. Uh, and, and Channel really does give us the ability to service the entire market opportunity, uh, no matter the size of the, uh, of the customer. Um, we've, we've also evidenced um, the increase in channel deals that are coming through in the year, as I've just um, touched on. Uh, in our Q4 alone, we signed 37 new customers, which was actually in the year a 76% increase when compared to our Q1. Um, so we're seeing that acceleration across just that financial year, which is, is, is great to see from my perspective. Um, and it's our partners who are contributing by majority to this acceleration uh, in these new logos that we're signing. Uh, with several uh, major partners fully enabled and onboarded in the year, uh, as shown on, uh, on, on the slide there, 8x8 and the uh, uh, talk desk reference there. Um, our partner program categorizes our partners into four groups. Uh, the main ones are integrated partners, uh, platform providers like um, Genesis, uh, who allow resale working relationships with suppliers like us, 
um, as well as the high growth and very exciting CCAS and UCAS sectors. So these are the cloud contact center as a service providers and the unified communications as a service providers. Um, generally, these are highly repeatable integrations, um, projects quick to deliver, and uh, quite a sweet spot for us uh, to a degree. We've got um, very strong coverage here. As, as we stated, we've got more than 40% of the uh, Gartner Magic Quadrant uh, that is reselling our, our services now. And, uh, and we're looking forward to those relationships maturing over time. Um, and then we also have solution providers. And, and these are resellers who sell third party telephony or services that go with those. And also payment providers, because we also work with uh, payment service providers and payment gateways. Um, uh, we may have some integration here, depending on the platforms uh, that they're selling, but, but sometimes it's a, it's a bit of a mixed bag. And then lastly, we have uh, referral partners and technology partners who either introduce business to us or provide us with accreditations to their own technology to enable us to sell to their own reseller communities or end customers. Uh, and in the year, we achieved these accredited positions across all services with major global companies such as Avaya and Cisco, uh, which has already led us to signing uh, several new resellers uh, in the UK uh, and, uh, and one in Ireland as well. Um, moving forward to the regional update and just some, some sort of uh, background on, on the North American opportunity that we have. Um, the, the opportunity that we have in North America is... You know, well, more specifically, the US uh, is the most significant opportunity in front of this business today. It's been the focus of the majority of our further investment in the business following our two funding rounds to date. Um, focusing on the, the US alone for, for a moment, because we do do business in Canada, but particularly it's, it's US where, where we see the major opportunity. As the slide says, the contact center market in the US is five to six times the size of the UK. And the UK is the largest contact center market in Europe. Three to four percent of the working population of the US works in contact centers. And in the US, they have over 4,000 contact centers with more than 11 agents. And of those, 37,000 have less than 250 seats. So it's a vast market. And with the majority of contact centers in the small to mid-sized category, it's really critical for PCI Power and the opportunity that we have to scale, that we're able to serve that small to mid-size uh, end cost effectively, which is why I keep repeating the light touch cloud channel approach, is it is these features of our business model that um, allow us to capitalize on, on the true breadth of the opportunity. Uh, and this is a, another unique competitive differentiator for us. It's not something that our, our competitors can, can easily do. And while it might surprise you, it often surprises people when I tell them this, we do have less competition in the US. Um, why is that? Uh, it's, it's a result of the UK market for security and contact centers being a number of years ahead of the US. Uh, so our two major competitors in the US are actually UK headquartered companies. Um, so as you can imagine, we know them pretty well by now. And we do compete with them from time to time, but, but mainly uh, that's when we're selling direct, um, less so when we're selling through channel partners. So how did we, we actually do in the region um, in terms of North American updates? Well, we're taking a big step forward. Um, I'm really pleased with the progress uh, we've made in just our second full financial year in the region. So it's only our as I say, second full financial year there. Uh, they've been doing really well since I left. I was actually based out there setting it up. Um, it's, it, it's a fairly short period of time uh, that we have been established in, in, in the region, but we've made good progress. We've signed um, 37 uh, new, uh, new customers, which is nearly double what we signed the previous year, and, uh, and increased the new contract recurring ACV uh, that William just touched on. Uh, signed in the year by 125% to just 1.1 million, uh, just under 1.1 million pounds. Um, and as a result, naturally, our TACV uh, now sits at just under 1.7 million, uh, which is a more than 180% uh, increase uh, year on year. <coughs> uh, we had some, some hugely positive uh, and frankly quite exciting sales highlights as part of this, um, which included signing one of the company's largest ever deals, with one of the largest um, privately owned companies in the US, uh, a company that employs more than uh, 50,000 people, so substantial organization. Um, pleased to say the customer is now live since the year end. 
uh, and that contract includes recurring ACV of nearly six hundred thousand uh, dollars per annum. So substantial for us. Um, we sold to a number of other well-known brands too, including our largest deal sold in Q4, which was to a well-known financial services company deploying our services to more than 700 agents. Um, and we actually achieved this deployment in record time for a large customer too, uh, with the customer going live in just nine weeks from Signature, which was, uh, which was great. Um, th that deal as well actually is, is a really great opportunity for us generally is that the project um, was for the customer's US business and they have a substantial European operation too. Um, and it was competitive. Um, the customer had already used one of our competitors previously, uh, a hardware solution, and did look around the market. Uh, so I think all in all, we've done a great job there, and there's some real potential with that relationship. We've also had some success displacing competitors more generally, and competitors' hardware solutions particularly. Um, we weren't the first in the UK to launch in the US in our space, as I've said before. In fact, that was by a number of years. Um, but those that had gone before us have mainly sold hardware and on-premise solutions. So whilst the majority of our opportunities are greenfield, generally, uh, we are finding occasional displacement opportunities uh, with customers that had adopted uh, hardware solutions um, earlier on. Now, with, with the stepped increases in sales and growth in our key sales metrics, we are naturally now beginning to see some flow through into recognised revenue as well. Uh, clearly, we're still in the early days of our US business, so it's not setting the world uh, on fire just yet, uh, but the trends are moving quickly uh, and revenue contribution from uh, the region to the group increased from 3% in our first year to 11% now. Uh, overall, um, and it's a question I get asked um, pretty frequently, um, we do anticipate the US business moving ahead of the UK business over the coming years, certainly first through sales bookings and then that will flow through. Uh, into revenue and the reasons for that are uh, primarily the, the market opportunity uh, size there but also that uh, the majority of our large partners are actually headquartered uh, in the territory as well which will have its uh, natural benefits. Uh, moving to EMEA uh, which is primarily our UK business, uh, we do have a growing customer base in mainland Europe as a result particularly of those uh, global partners uh, proactively selling us there but primarily uh, our customers and, and all of our team are in the UK. <coughs> uh, the EMEA business has made, made good progress, uh, being the more mature region for us, given it uh, it was where we started, revenues are naturally further ahead and, and we've, we've seen a substantial jump forward in recognised revenue in the year, increasing 43% uh, year on year to 3.9 million. We've increased our key sales metric of TACV by 46% year on year to just under 5.1 million, giving us that uh, forward-looking revenue visibility. Um, this growth would have been a bit stronger, but but for delays in new sales, uh, decision-making that we reported as a result of the initial uh, COVID impacts, uh, with our year-on-year -year ACV that we added into the pot, 8% uh, increase at uh, 1.53 million. Now, as I mentioned a few times now, we're not the first to invest properly in our market. Uh, that doesn't just apply to the US, it also applies to the UK. So whilst we're the only cloud vendor with a partner first sales approach, a number of our competitors in the UK uh, had to a degree stolen the march on us with regards to working with the sorts of companies we would seek to partner with typically. Um, so at the start of the year just gone, we set out a uh, competitor displacement strategy in, uh, in, in EMEA uh, with respect to uh, prospective resellers um, across that market. Um, personally, I, I like this one, of course, being fairly competitive and yeah, this has been a real success for us um, so far. Um, we've displaced competitors at three important resellers in EMEA, uh, two in the UK and one in Ireland. Uh, all three were signed in our second half of the year. Uh, one has been onboarded and we already have customers live. Uh, we've sold through another and going through deployment there. And the third, we're going through onboarding with them currently. Um, all three are major resellers of Genesis or Avaya, both uh, major telephony platforms. Uh, and we'll maintain this strategy in EMEA, particularly given some of our competitors have struggled during COVID to deliver projects due to the nature of their hardware on-premise solutions uh, that need to, them to have access to customer sites, which, um, as I've said, is not a problem for us. We can deliver entirely remotely um, fairly easily, which, uh, which is a good segue uh, onto our operations update. Um, so conscious of time, I'm going to round out the slides soon. Uh, 
again, really pleased. I mean, as we said right at the beginning, we are pleased with this update. So if I keep saying that, that's why. Uh, really pleased with uh, how well the restructuring uh, of our engineering and professional services teams has gone in its first full year since changes were made uh, not long after I, I took over as CEO in October 2018. Uh, we've taken a big step forward in, in new customers deployed year on year with 71 new customers live in the period. Uh, this is a 154% increase on the prior year. Um, again, when I took over under two years ago, I was very open with investors that this was an area we needed to improve on. Um, we've obsessed about it and our time to go live metric, TTGL, uh, has been key to this, uh, as well as having the whole business on board with its importance. So I'm really proud with this step forward that the whole team at PCI Power have contrib uh, contributed to. And in terms of our TTGO averages as such, um, we've continued to reduce our average time to deliver by nearly 15% year on year. Uh, we've changed the metric this year, providing an average across all projects, no matter what deployment type. So it's, it, it's a very clear message. Um, previously, we provided a, a, a range. And as we've stated in our report, new projects which are coming through under our newer processes uh, and controls are delivering even faster. So uh, what we've been doing uh, is working. Um, and actually, a really good example of the improvements we've made in uh, professional services uh, is the large US contract that I mentioned earlier. This, um, this deal was won not only through a competitive tender process against our main competition in the US, but as if that wasn't enough, um, it included a head-to-head -head proof of concept phase as well. Uh, not something we come across very frequently ever. In fact, it might have even been the first one. So um, the final two down-selected vendors had to run a POC project head-to-head -head, uh, whilst being assessed by the customer. Uh, we came out of this with, uh, with, with glowing colours and uh, having been selected as a preferred supplier, I'm really pleased to say that, uh, that, that as I said earlier, that customer is, uh, is now live. Um, now, underpinning uh, much of what we do is the security and compliance of our systems uh, with the highest level of, of compliance with PCI data security standard. And we've recertified across all services this year, as, as well as continuing our ISO accreditations, which are quite broad, um, but we consider very important, particularly given the size of some of the, the partners that we, that, that we work with. To start rounding up the presentation, um, I wanted to give you a view of my near term focus points, I tend to do this at the end of these slides. So you can see what's, uh, what's on my mind. Um, I think it's fairly obvious that, 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 that we feel good about the business. We're, we're, we're very excited by, by not only the prospects, but what as a team we're doing day to day. Uh, that's very important as a, as a small high growth company. Uh, when I look back at where we've come from just two years ago, I'm, I'm, I'm really very proud of what, what the team here has achieved. Um, to achieve our near term objectives, um, we've got to capitalize on the channels we put in place. Um, continue to grow pipelines and increase our sales velocity, the pace at which we sign customers. Um, we must continue our obsession with Time to Go Live, TTGL, and be recognized as, as the leader in our space consistently for this. Uh, and we must continue expanding our, our partner base. Um, but we will do this in a very targeted and precise way, uh, quality over quantity. Uh, but when we do bring on new partners, uh, we must rapidly on board and enable them to produce. Um, so to a degree, uh, it, it's more of the same. And then just to, just to finish up, um, in terms of the outlook and the current trading, um, I'm getting quite a lot of feedback here, Mark, by the way. I don't know if you can control that from your end. Uh, in terms of the outlook and current trading, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pleased to report that we've made a strong start to the new financial year. Uh, of which we're now the majority through our, our Q1. Uh, pipelines are stacking up well currently. Uh, we've signed over 20 new customers in the period to date. Uh, and uh, also critical to that positive outlook is our continual ability to, to deliver. And uh, given our strong capabilities here due to our cloud product base, uh, we've been able to retain market guidance, as I stated earlier. And we're showing more than 50% revenue growth anticipated in this coming year. Uh, you'll have seen from the current trading notes of uh, of the report that revenues in the year so far in the first two months are more than 40% ahead of the same period last year. So we're well on track and making good progress to where we need to get to. Um, some highlights since the year end include uh, a really exciting contract with a major well-known retailer headquartered in North America. Uh, they've stores all over the world and, and we're supplying our secure payment services to their main contact center, which uh, is in the region with over 1,500 agents. Um, we launched a new product as well, our, our speech recognition capability for both our agent assist and IVR products, 
and that enables our customers to choose between accepting secure payments through keypad entry or spoken voice. Uh, and similar to my, my, my year summary slide at the beginning, I'll round out this slide with uh, further, th further comments on our um, activity strengthening the breadth of resources available to the board. Um, personally, really excited that we've been able to establish the advisory committee. Uh, we announced that uh, I think it was earlier this month, back in the last month. Uh, we've worked extremely hard to build the foundations of this business, in particular our market leading cloud platform, as well as establishing uh, sizable routes to, to market through our channel sales strategy. And, and we must leverage this and capitalize on it. And the advisory committee adds a breadth of knowledge to allow me and the board uh, to plan for the long term future of this business. And that about finishes off the, the walkthrough. Um, so thank you for listening to Women and I today. Uh, I hope it's been interesting and useful. And we we'll now try and respond to as many of your questions as, as we can in the time that's uh, remaining. Super, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, James. Thank you, William. Um, now, if we could turn to those questions, um, we, we have a number of questions that were submitted ahead of the presentation. Um, but please, uh, for those who haven't submitted questions, if you're keen to do so, uh, please continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab uh, situated on the top right hand corner of your screen. Um, I'd just like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed by your investor dashboard um, on the Investor Meet Company platform. Um, additionally, uh, your feedback is very important, so immediately after the presentation has ended, you'll be directed for the, per for the opportunity to provide that feedback. If you could do that, that would be greatly that'd be appreciated. Um, while you are submitting questions, can we, can we have a first look at those that were submitted ahead of the event? Um, we, we have covered uh, revenue, cash and debt quite extensively, but there's one question here that might be worthy of, of William you uh, just uh, touching on again. Um, the question said, great progress. What visibility do you have in terms of your revenue? Um, thank you, Tom. Uh, yes, um, yeah, we, we, we go into the financial year in FY21 uh, with at least 80 to 90% uh, revenue visibility backed on the TACV number, the, uh, the, the the contracts I have in the filing cabinet effectively, and then add to add to that the IFRS 15 released. So we have very high visibility, visibility going into each financial year, and we hope to have the same going into FY22 numbers. Great. Okay, super. And uh, maybe, James, uh, I've got a couple of questions I'm going to combine here, actually, um, uh, for you. Um, and they're in respect of, of capital. Um, you, you reference in the chairman's statement under fundraiser, these additional funds will also allow the company, company to consider potential new expansion opportunities in the future. Can you expand on examples of new expansion opportunities? And if I can just combine that with this other question, um, which is fully drawn down on debt facilities this month. Does this constrain limit investment or impede you in any way? Those probably combine quite nicely. Yeah, okay, Tom, thanks. So uh, yeah, the debt, debt was drawn down this month uh, because we had to, that was the, the deadline, that was the latest we could do it. So um, actually purposely planned that we did it then. Um, it doesn't constrain the current plan, it was part of the current plan. So that uh, action of drawing it down uh, was not unexpected. So that was something we planned to do anyway. Um, and it's in line with everything we planned based on the, uh, the, the market forecasts. And, and, and we believe that we can operate and continue to invest in, in the key areas that we referenced at our fundraise in March. So primarily those are more investment into North America and also additional investment into product. But clearly, given uh, what's gone on, on in the world over the last um, five to six months, we're taking a slightly more cautious view with that investment. So. You know, our plans today compared to what they look like looking out in March uh, are a little bit more conservative. Um, but uh, I think all of our existing investors will be pleased to hear that, that we take a more, more, more cautious approach to it. Um, just getting to the other part of that question in terms of other um, expansion opportunities. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, th again, this does come into play because we are taking a slightly more cautious approach. Um, so we're not going to go charging off down a new opportunity right away without any real uh, care or consideration as to what might happen over the autumn and winter with, uh, with with the pandemic. But as we've shown, the business is very resilient to it, given the nature of what we do and, and how we do it. Um, we come across new opportunities week in, week out, pretty much. Um, 
you know, as a, as a small growing company that works with large organizations, um, we, we could find ourselves in the position where uh, we have, if I give you an example, a major new partner, for example, and we want to invest more in that to make sure that we capitalize on that scale opportunity into the future. Um, that, that's in particular the sort of thing on a practical uh, level that, that might be something that, uh, that would require us to, to make some additional investments in the future. But of course, um, our current sales plans and what we anticipate doing over the next couple of years are built into the, 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 the market forecasts um, uh, that are out there. There is another question, Tom, that you could probably link on the end of these, which was submitted in advance related to the advisory committee. Um, and that question was, um, is the committee's focus likely to be directed towards enhancing the yield of the existing contract and customer base or towards horizontal diversification into allied fintech activities? Well, what I would say is this week, seeing investors all week, it's great that our investors are picking up on the importance of the advisory committee. And it's great to see that that recognized here as well. Um, We've worked really hard, as I said in the presentation, to build the foundation of this business, and in particular, the global SaaS cloud platform that we've got today, um, you know, the all singing, all dancing SaaS platform, um, that carries real strength for us from a foundational perspective for scale in the future, um, but also our channel sales model. So we've got significant access uh, growing to market through, through these relationships that we're starting to now build. Um, we, we did state in our report that we are starting to build a new rolling five-year plan, but very much right now it's, it's more of the same. But the advisory committee was important for us because it's a very cost-effective way, actually, to ensure that we get uh, a really good breadth uh, of, uh, of industry experience, not just in uh, what we do in security and contact centers, but we touch many other industries as well, like payments and fintech and regtech generally. So it's just to ensure that very long term uh, that, that we're looking to maximize the opportunity for this business. But we're not planning any immediate changes of dire direction or anything because uh, we, we've still got a lot of potential to realize under the, uh, the existing plan. Okay, super. Thank you. And we've got a couple of questions. One in respect of a contract specifically, and then and then we've got some competitor questions which we'll come on to. But um, maybe I can just ask you uh, one question here. You recently won a significant new contract to provide agent assist and digital secure payment solutions. Could you give me an idea of the duration of this win from start to end, and highlight what you think the reason was behind selecting PCI PAL over its rivals? Okay, so that one I believe is a three-year contract. Um, you will notice though we, that we talk about annual contract values. We don't talk about total contract values. We phased that out um, about 18 months ago. That was purposeful. Um, you know, we, we are a SaaS business. Uh, our contracts are all rolling. Um, they're very sticky. We have very high retention. So uh, that's why we don't rent, mention the, the, the length of it necessarily because we expect it expect it to renew but yeah that was a, a three-year contract and we do tend to lead with three years but we will go a little lower than that um if we if we have to um uh, the other part of the question was why why did we why did we win it um well i, I think in general wh why do we win direct deals like this because it was a direct deal um because if we if we're winning business through channel partners it's it's often because we're working through the partner as well that has a big factor in that but when we're winning direct um i'd say it's a combination of things uh, we're a pure play in our market so um the products that i've talked to you about today are the only products that we have and sell and the the, the issues that we allow customers to deal with as a result of using those are are all that we're focused on so we're very simple messaging uh, and we do that uh, without impacting uh, that end customer's ability to make choices on other areas of their infrastructure or technology that they use in that contact center. And sometimes that's seen as a significant benefit that we're so light touch in that respect. But it also means that our people and our approach is very focused on this specific problem. Uh, and that, that is a competitive differentiator for us in, in, in some respects. So, um, and I would always say that, that our people play a really big part in winning deals. Um, our, you know, our personality, I didn't talk about it at the start on the About Us slide. We've got our values in there, which have been even more important to us through COVID. But uh, we've got great employee retention, very high. And we've got fantastic people in this business um, that we take great care to, uh, 
uh, to hire and we take great care to, to develop as well. That plays a key part in it. Great. Okay. Just one very quick question here, which I think might be worthy of you just touching on, because uh, I think it would hopefully just clear up any confusion. Um, we've got one here saying, um, surely people are moving to paying for things online and via apps rather than through telephone call centers. So although large, isn't your market ultimately going to dwindle away? Yeah. Okay. So there's a couple of parts to that. Uh, uh, the contact centre market, just to be clear, is not getting any smaller. It's actually grown. Uh, if you look at the, the stats on the US, it's grown over the last couple of years. Uh, it's, and it's expected to, to, to hold out. Um, and we're not anticipating any, any reduction in, in contact centres. So the market itself, in terms of the amount of agents and addressable market for us, is likely to stay the same. Um, but to, to, to agree with that point, uh, there's some validity in there in that the, the, the channel mix within contact centers is changing. Um, we do actually have an appendix slide uh, in this deck, which I think uh, you guys have got access to, which shows you the channel split from some analysis of US contact centers. And what you'll see is that there's a digital transformation shift going on in contact centers, but that's actually going on pretty much everywhere in the world that you look. And, and what's happening is your traditional voice engagement into contact centers, which is picking up a phone and speaking to somebody or picking up a phone and using an automated service. Uh, no, it's not that one, it's the next one if somebody's going through the slides. Um, uh, we're also, what you're seeing now, as you can see from the slide on screen, uh, is the increase in the adoption of so the green section on that graph is, uh, is email. Um, the sort of turquoise blue color, which is potentially growing the fastest, is web chat. So you're seeing these digital channels, but what people don't always know is if you engage with a company through web chat or through email or through social media, well, they get handled by contact centers. That's why they're called contact centers today, not call centers, because they do a lot more than just answering phone calls. And our partners that we sell through, they provide the technology that not only handles the phone calls, but it also handles the digital interactions as well. So, uh, no, we're not anticipating that shift. And then the final point I'd, I'd probably make is that uh, something we've seen anecdotally over the last five months is that there's far less people going into shops. So actually, contact centers uh, have got busier. Uh, and certainly we're seeing our retail clients being uh, being very busy again uh, right now, having had having had a bit of a lull. Uh, but contact centres in the UK as well, some areas of them were classified as key workers because it was the only way to actually keep communication going. So, uh, no, they're still they're still very critical and we don't see uh, uh, payment volumes slipping away. Great. OK, super. Look, we're, we're coming up to the hour. So there's one very last question, which I think is interesting just from a market perspective. And, and then we'll then we'll close the presentation. Um, we have uh, a question here. Um, how much competition do you see with other UK vendors in the US? Can you describe this more? And do you see strong US based players emerging? Um, OK, so in the US, uh, we only have two competitors who are UK vendors. Uh, and actually, I would consider there are two main competitors in the US. Um, so as I said through the presentation, the UK market was slightly ahead, well, slightly a number of years ahead of the US in this. So uh, us and those com competitors have been able to get uh, ahead of the game in that respect. So uh, they're the companies that we compete with the most. Um, and then in terms of US-based players uh, coming through, um, there are a couple but they are small privately owned organizations that aren't really doing a great deal. Um, so we don't anticipate seeing any large competitors coming into play in the US. And the reason why I say that is because, uh, and it's one of the reasons we have a channel model, is because um, PCI is a very tricky challenge to deal with, and it could potentially be a fairly significant distraction for any of the large tech companies that you might expect to get involved in this. You know, you could ask the question, why don't 8x8 have their own solution? Why don't TalkDesk have their own solution? Why don't Vonage have their own solution? Well, because if we can be easy to work with, uh, they'd much rather outsource that to us to deal with. And that's why we, we thought that the channel model would work well in this market. So uh, no, it, it's, uh, and we know our competitors report the same, that uh, there is low competition in the US and we're not really seeing uh, any new new players coming, coming to the market, uh, which is good as we, we continue to push on. 
Great, super. All right, well, look, I think I think that uh, that should do it now. So uh, thank you, James. Thank you, William, for updating investors today. Um, can I ask everybody not to close this session as you will now be automatically redirected uh, for the opportunity to provide your feedback. Um, if you access this meeting from your website, then the feedback page will appear. If you access from a link sent to you by email, you'll be asked to log in to submit your feedback. Um, if anyone has any further questions or would like additional information on PCI PAL, uh, please do get in touch via PCI PAL at allbrookpr.com. Um, however, in the meantime, thank you all for attending. Thank you, James. Thank you, William. And we hope to update you again soon. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, everybody.